a river board for a number of years. We're at the Crescenta Valley Water District, where Ernie serves as a member of the Board of Directors. This is January the 23rd, 2007. So, Ernie, thank you very much for agreeing to do one of the oral histories for the Colorado River Board. And uh, we were talking before we started the tape. Let's uh, let's just get in right into it uh, with respect to how you wound up uh, working for the Colorado River Board and when that was. Uh, I understand that you were uh, you had started with DWR, the Department of Water Resources. Yes. Uh, so how did all of that unfold that you wound up at the Colorado River Board? Well, I started with Department of Water Resources, worked on the state water project, and then the relationships and some of the issues coming up with the Colorado River Board and asked, started asking me questions and whether I was interested in looking at some of those things. And to be honest, uh, layoffs were coming with the state or with Department of Water Resources as things slowed down. And so there was an opportunity to join the Colorado River Board. And uh, Colorado River Board got active active and we're looking at Colorado River issues. What kinds of work did you do for the Department of Water Resources before you joined the uh, staff of the board? Well I started out just looking at some of the facilities in their early development just geologic aspects and then I got more involved in the groundwater side of the department's activity Water Resource Department's uh, activities in the Colorado, in the groundwater basin issues and looking at developing and utilizing imported water in conjunction with groundwater supplies. Well, did you work then on the California State Water Project? Yes, yes, in fact I did. I, the first thing I did with DWR was I walked the state aqueduct alignment from the delta all the way down to Southern California over a period of time. You walked to that well, distance before yeah, the aqueduct was Yeah, well, long before the aqueduct was during the time that the development was going on. And so part of it was to look at the geologic conditions and ground conditions, and we just hoofed that out. We sh probably should establish that you are a geologist by training, is that right? Right, yes. By formal training, I'm a geologist. And was your job with the Department of Water Resources, your first professional job, or? Yes, it was the first professional job. I had other activities. I had to, was in grad school for a while, decided I needed to, got married, and needed to, <laughs> to support my wife and myself. So uh, that's when I went to work, was, and DWR was dropping off people at that point they were cutting back and I had an opportunity to join the Colorado River Board and that's... So what year would that have been that you joined the board approximately? Boy, I have... <laughs> I'm really guessing. Well, it, uh, who was the uh, chief engineer or the uh, chief executive officer at the board when you joined the board? It was certainly before Myron Holder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was be whoever preceded Myron. Okay. Um, what kinds of things was the board involved in when you joined the Colorado River Board? What kinds of things were they doing? Well, I think they were just looking at water, how much yield of the river what there was, what the pot potential use for putting that water to beneficial use into Southern California. Okay. Uh, and uh, obviously, Metropolitan's aqueduct had been built. That's right. Uh, Coachella was taking their water. Water. Uh, Imperial Irrigation District uh, was taking theirs, and, and the PVID, which has the, the original right, was right. obviously taking theirs. Uh, were there were there any water supply issues at that time uh, with respect to the six agencies? I think there was, but I didn't get involved from it. I just looked at it. I was off from the side, so I remember there were discussions about who should be get whether one agency should be getting another. Areas were being developed and needed water supplies, and but I don't remember any of the details because okay. I wasn't intimately involved. I just hear from it. From the, 
right. on the sideline, so to speak. Well, in, in what uh, fashion did you use your uh, geology background with respect to the activities of the board? You were looking at groundwater basin? We were looking at groundwater yield. We were looking at uh, where we could drop, pump groundwater, where we could recharge some areas. Okay, but the Colorado River Board never did that. No, no, that was all done. We didn't do that as, as the Colorado River Board. Mm -hmm. Colorado River Board was dealing with the other agencies who had rights into the Colorado, like Coachella, Palo Verde, all of those people had some rights to Colorado River water, as I recall. Uh, or would it be fair then to say that you were doing technical work on behalf of the members of oh, the board? That's correct. Okay. Uh, does any particular groundwater basin come to your mind in terms of studying it and, and being concerned about it? And I'll, while you're thinking about that, I'll give you one example, and, and maybe you can build off of that. Uh, only a few years ago, Metropolitan started an experimental program out at Hayfield, uh, the Heinz Pumping Pumping near Shilako Summit. And they put some water in the ground with the hopes of extracting it later on, and it turned out to not to be a useful project. Uh, were there projects like that that you were looking at? Yeah. Uh, gee, I don't recall it. We, they're very similar to that. Uh, we were looking at areas, I can remember down in the Coachella Valley, there we, we were looking at water supply, they were looking at water supply and utilizing it in various parts of the area. And they were, as I recall, they were drawing on Colorado River water that was being put to use in some of those areas. So Colorado River water was being served in numerous areas in the desert areas out in that area. Okay, and, and I just, I, I'm not gonna try to pin you down no, on, that's a, right. on an exact date, but are we talking early 60s, mid 60s? Uh, keeping in mind, if, if you need to work back, think about the state water project which began delivering water to Southern California in 1972. So it would have been in about that, that era, I think. That era being the late 60s? Yeah, late 60s to early 70s, somewhere in there. Okay. I think you're aware that Coachella Valley Water District is a contractor to the state water project. Water project. project. Yes, I knew that. But they do not have a connection to the state water project. They're not physically no, connected. No, right. And so they exchange water no. with Metropolitan. In the process of doing that, they turn water out at Whitewater, and uh, they allow it to percolate right. into the groundwater basin. Were you involved in, in any of the studies that led to that agreement, or? Uh... Just peripherally. I did not get involved in any of the agreements, or I just took it from a technical interest point of view. Well, well let's talk yeah. about that for a minute, from a technical standpoint, because that had never been done before. No, that's true. Uh, I mean, there was certainly some natural runoff would come down the white water from time to time. But what was happening was that a lot of that water that was being released was percolating into the underground, and then groundwater flow was moving down to the low end of the Coachella Valley. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if you can get it into the ground and it can move from area A to area B without losing a lot to evaporation, you can move water without the, the loss that if you would put it by surface flow down there. So if you get it into the ground and you can get it to move as groundwater flow, the loss to, to surface evaporation is cut, down, cut back. Okay. Did the other agencies, and I'm going back now to this 1969-1970 yeah. era, uh, they, all of, most of the agencies have fairly large staffs now, and they've got engineers everywhere. And right. Whatnot. Did they not have those kinds of people? 
They had a few, but usually the general manager oftentimes was an engineer or water expert, and, and that's the kind of people I recall working with more than having, you know, somebody like CDM or somebody with a big engineering company that came down. Most of, a lot of it was done by local people. The local engineers and water people in Coachella, for example, I remember them coming out on it, and they go. I'd go out with with them, you know, and they'd say, "Well, what do you think about this, or what do you think about that, sort of thing," and that was sort of my role. I'm going to guess that you were one of the few uh, geologists uh, around, at least in the water business. Yeah, I don't think there were, you know, most of the geologists that, that early time, my era, wasn't involved in groundwater. That was they were all working on a state water project, and that's. That's one of the, that was my first job with the state, was to walk the state aqueduct alignment from the delta all the way down to Southern California and just look at the geologic conditions. You must have crossed the San Andreas Fault a few times. Yeah, I'm sure I did, but I wasn't sure where it was, <laughs> to be honest with you. I was young and stupid then. I'm even stupider now, but I mean, at that time, I really was, I was in a learning phase. I had just graduated from college, and so, you know, you don't learn a lot of that. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about geology for just, just a few minutes. Uh, does, it's, it's a fact that California, Southern California specifically, and Northern California to a lesser degree uh, is, uh, or contains earthquake faults all over the place, oh, yes. and literally thousands of them. That's right. Uh, so, from a from a geologist standpoint, given the Colorado River Aqueduct that Metropolitan owns, and given the All American Canal, mm -hmm. and, and given the Coachella Canal, uh, does the prospect of an earthquake interrupting any of those systems concern you as a geologist? Not really. I think that the engineering that has gone into looking at those things, and they recognize that there's going to be problems, but it, not all of the canals that deliver water are concrete lined that are going to rupture. There's a lot of earthen lined canals, particularly as you get down the low end of the Coachella Valley. And so I think they're a little less susceptible than if you were to to break off a pipeline, or you have the state water project where it's all contained in a concrete lining, and if that whole thing lets go, uh, that puts it out of business for a long time, where the earthen canals can sort of stand up, they can take a little more motion. And were you involved, were there any studies done by the board uh, while you were on the board with respect to uh, uh, earthquake vulnerability? Either on the state water project or the Colorado. Not Springs. that I, not that I was involved of or even recall at this time. Okay. Uh, how? Let's see. Let's assume that you started with the Colorado River Board in the late '60s, because I, I appreciate there's some uh, overlap there with the Department of Water Resources. Yes. Uh, and how long were you with the Colorado River Board then? When did you retire? <laughs> I don't. I can't remember, Jay, when it was that I retired. And then uh, when I officially retired, and then what happened is I, after I officially retired, I would do some consulting, if you will, to some of those local water districts if they wanted assistance. Well, I, what do you mean by? When you say local water district, do you well, mean like members? Coachella? Okay, like Coachella, uh, uh, Coachella Imperial, Imperial. Or yeah, or those those districts are the people I really dealt with. I didn't deal much at all with Metropolitan as such. Okay, because they didn't have a ro Met didn't have a role down there in that part of the area, as I recall. I mean, they were supplying water, but they didn't have an integral hand in what happened with the local water district sometimes. Okay. Well, since you spent some time down there, and I will define down there as uh, Coachella, Imperial County area, mm -hmm. uh, what, 
what are your what can you tell us about the geology of that area? I mean, it's it's kind of a valley. Uh, don't know where that came from. Yeah. Uh, you got the Salton Sea. You got the Salton low Sea level. Uh, you know, and and here, here today in 2007, we're still trying to figure out how to solve the Salton Sea issues. Uh, you've got a lot of farm runoff that runs to the Salton Sea. So I, my question to you is, as a geologist, describe for us, if you would, some of the more interesting features that you had to deal with when you were working with these agencies, primarily out in the desert. Well, I think it were, to look at what was happening with applied water, water that was applied sometimes in excess of demand and where that water went, and whether it repercolated or whether some of it flowed surface-wise down to the next user. Because as you keep going further down in the valley and she gets closer to the Salton Sea, or not the Salton Sea, the... Uh, the border. Border, the border. border, yeah. Then you see all of those wetlands and then you've got the whole issues with the uh, water moving across the border into Mexico and those agricultural areas that are closest to the border, of course, end up with, with the water as it comes off. Now, if you've got a lot of pollutants or, or salines that are picked up, then that quality of that water is not as good, and it takes maybe more water application to get a good crop out without some damage or, you know, I don't know enough about agriculture to talk about it. Well, how about, uh, I mean, one of, uh, let me frame the question this way. As you know, one of the issues right now is the lining of the All-American Canal, uh, because it, currently it's urban. It, and it leaks. It leaks. Um, and uh, Mexico's position, uh, as of this date, is that they have rights to that water because it becomes groundwater when it leaks from the canal. Right. Uh, what what are your thoughts again as a geologist and someone who knows that area? What are your thoughts about the permeability of the soil in that area, and and is that happening? And uh, oh, I I think the soil is not as permeable as alluvial fan, obviously, because it's a lot of clay and finer grain material. But there is groundwater motion motion that moves down gradient toward the border, toward the Gulf. And so any additional pumping as you develop more and more agriculture, urbanization, whatever it is, they're, have to, they're relying primarily on groundwater, except unless whatever they pull off Metropolitan's aqueduct, you know. Right. So any additional, the more development you get as you go further south, the less flow is going to go down into the Gulf, and that's what the Mexicans are complaining about. Those wetlands are, I don't know, drying up, but they don't have the ability, and they rely on some of that water. They have relied in the past, as I understand it. Okay. Uh, I, I met you probably in 1980 when you were with the board and I was with Metropolitan. And I believe Myron Holbert was the uh, chief executive officer of the board at that time. I'm not sure what his title was. Of the Colorado River Board. Of the Colorado Yes, Report. right. Myron was. And Myron was followed by Vern Valentine. Valentine, correct, yes. And then Vern was followed by Dennis Underwood. Underwood. Is that Correct. It's the last person I remember. <laughs> I don't know who's there now or if there was somebody there. Right. So, but, but you worked for Dennis? Yes. Okay, well that's good because that kind of establishes a time frame for us there because, yes. as you know, Dennis left to, to become commissioner, commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation. Reclamation right. Uh, and were you still there at the board when he left? Yes, I think about the, yeah, but I was still there but just about ready to to retire. Okay, so you and Dennis left yeah, about the same, same time. Roughly the same time. Which would have been in the late 1990s. So yeah. Probably 97 or 90. Somewhere in there, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you, let, then let's, let's talk for a minute about the three people that you worked for at the board. 
That would be Myron. Myron. And Vern and Dennis. Right. Uh, so let's start with Myron, and, and not not personalities. No, I did in the kinds of projects that that you guys were working on during Myron's tenure, and what your involvement was in any of those projects. Uh, can you can you think of any major events or initiatives or projects that Myron got rolling uh, that, that were important to Colorado River users in California? Or negotiations for that? Yeah. Had, it seems to me there was some controversy with Coachella at one point, but I don't, again, I, I'm sorry, I'm not a very <laughs> A, a good uh, historian well, for you, but uh, yeah, there were, were various projects. There were some s small canals that were lined. There were some, uh, Coachella had quite an established uh, office and, and a lot of staff that worked on, I guess, just helping distribute the water uh, to the various components of their system, because they had a distribution system, as I recall. Right. And then that fed down to Imperial, who had their distribution system. Okay. And then at the end, what was left over got washed down to Mexico. And of course, the objective, as I recall, was you let us little go to Mexico, <laughs> into the Gulf. You didn't want to waste it into the Gulf, if at all possible. Okay. And, and as you know, uh, very, very little water actually winds up in the, That's right. in the Gulf of California. Yeah. Uh, when you started working for the board, I believe you were located downtown. In yes. The Reagan uh, State Office building, the Ronald Reagan State I Office I think building. so, wherever it was, it was downtown. And uh, so you were... You were still with the board when they moved into their newer offices in Glendale, California. That's right. We moved to Glendale. Which is where they are today. Yes. Uh, were there, can, can you talk a little bit about any changes that might have occurred when Myron retired and Vern Valentine became the, the head of the board? Uh, were this, was there any new direction or? I don't recall any major direction. They were totally different individuals. So the way you sat down with them, whether you, you know, Vern was, Valentine was somebody that, uh, well, first place, I used to ride to, back and forth to work with them. So, so you, you got into a lot of discussions that went on. Uh, Myron had a very strong opinion what he wanted you know, how he wanted things to go, and you sort of followed the way he wanted to do that, which I f found perfectly satisfactory to me. I mean, I was happy. I was still a young, well, still a young kid on the block, so I was learning and everything. I could gain knowledge of the river system was by working with him and dealing with them. Vern had a little closer contact because we used to carpool together, and so there was a lot of more discussion going on in the carpool or wherever we were uh, because we weren't virtually neighbors that lived a couple of blocks away. What kinds of things interested Vern? What I in the water business, not personal. Yeah, no, I know. With respect to the board, what? Where did he seem to be headed? Oh, that's hard to say. I'm not sure if I know where he was headed. Uh, I mean, did, did you have a sense of what his priorities were? Well, I think his priority was, he was always one, my experience with him in the years I'd worked with him at Water Reef, he's always trying to make sure everybody gets treated equally and that everything works out all right. And. He seems to be able to develop in his presentation a way of dealing with the people, of everybody being satisfied that he, you know, is giving everybody fair treatment. Okay, so he was sort of staff driven, if you will. I mean, he was looking after the staff That's right. and the members. And the, the members, yeah. And uh, 
the way you're describing him, he sounds like he was somewhat of a compromiser, which is, that's not a bad word. No, it's, no, but I, I think, yeah, he, I think he was, he never want, he, I can't say that he acted it, but I never had the feeling that he was going to sit down and stomp his foot and say, this is the way it's going to be. He was always trying to get everybody together and get a compromise position where he could get satisfaction or hopefully satisfaction between all of all the members or the parties involved rather than to get into a confrontational mode. Okay, now let, let's step back then, if you would. What, what do you think Myron's focus or priorities were? Myron yeah, he was a little earlier in time, and I think he, he had his goal. He, was, he wanted to get this thing rolling and getting it implemented. Now, when you say this thing... Well, the, getting the water distributed down and, and shared equally or got distribution down to where it needed to be to make sure that Coachella got its share at the time it needed it. Uh, the other water districts down there when they needed water would try to be a compromise where everybody got together. Because those water districts were somewhat combatable at, at a time and I think they, they weren't so combative as time went along as I, they got the water in and they got it distributed. I think there was a lot more harmony. But that was just from my, you know, observation from seeing those people down there. And then moving forward from Vern, uh, that would be Dennis Underwood. Underwood. Um, how would you characterize his focus and his priorities? Uh, I think Dennis was more of a, I would look at him more as a leader. I mean, he was running the show. And, you know, he, he said, well, this is what we're going to do. And then we sort of made that We'd argue, you could argue with him, you know, but he, he was very decided in what he wanted to do, and I think he was very successful at, at doing that. Well, you had known Dennis for a number of years. Oh, yeah, I was on yeah, there yeah, before. sure. You know, no, no, I'd known him for, and I have no, I had no problems with him. He didn't upset me at all. I could, he was fine. I, I liked him personally. He, I thought he handled all the staff very well. Some of them got upset, but, you know. I'm going to guess that you found it necessary to branch off from strict geology while you were working for the board. And again, I'm guessing, so if I'm wrong, no, that, but I, I'm going to assume that you did things that were not necessarily geology oriented. Oh yeah, right. I looked at water quality, I looked at, you know, tried to talk to the people who were using the water, how much did they have to apply. Usually the geologists don't do that, the engineers do that. And I found that a very interesting part of the activity. And so I tended to try and work with, peop with the people. It was a learning experience for me. And then I felt that I could say, well, you know, if you, guys, if you would apply your water at this time instead of an Day, morning hours or the hot heat of the day, it could do things. Are we talking about agricultural users here? Yeah, well now we're down in the Imperial Coachella Valley. Uh, would it be fair then to suggest that when you were early on the, uh, with the board, uh, that water may not have been being used very efficiently? Yeah, I think probably I felt that way, whether rightly or wrongly, but I didn't feel it always that it was the most efficient way to do things. They let water run down the canal, and if it spilled over, it spilled over. And, and did you see a change over time while you, were, while you were at the board? Yeah, I think it became more the, the efficiency, efficient use of the water and a lot less, the reduction in losses, you know, seemed to improve, in my opinion. As time went, as the time went on, and they became more and more efficient in in uh, putting that water to beneficial use. Okay. And a better timing of a crop application instead of the on 
whatever they what do they call the guys that came out. Oh, the Zan Zan heroes. heroes, yeah. You know, they might come out and turn the water on in the morning and come back at five that night if they were lucky or if they had something else to do, they might not come back till the next morning. And so you had a lot of water that was not being put ultimately to the beneficial use it could have been. Maybe it kept some of the native plants green, but it didn't provide what it was intended for was for agriculture. Did you have occasion to travel with any of the directors, like Sacramento or D.C.? Or, uh, I mean, certainly there were meetings with state elected officials. And I would go occasionally to Sacramento. I never went to the east, to Washington. And why, what, what kinds of things would you have the need to go to Sacramento for? I mean, are, we, are we talking about meetings with DWR, or are we talking about meetings with elected officials? Or what kinds of issues were there? I don't know. Some of the issues, I wasn't sure why. For example, Myron or Vot Myron said, why don't you come along with us? Well, it was really a listening and observing opportunity for me to find out what all the issues were and then somebody would complain about it, at least I could have some intelligent answer if I thought there was what I could give. But a lot of times I didn't, uh, at that time I had a couple, well no I didn't, we were, we were expect, expecting shortly and so I didn't really want to go away too long, so. Oh, you were expecting children? Yeah. Okay. And so I didn't want to, you know, leave the, go away for a long period of time. But I enjoyed going down to Coachella all the time. I went down quite frequently. And I go down, spend some time, go out in the field with their staff. Okay. Um, after you left the Colorado River Board, retired, mm -hmm. uh, you stayed in the area, obviously. Yes. We're here in La Crescenta. Right. <laughs> um, and you did not get out of the water business, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> no. No, I enjoyed it. And so I, uh, someone asked me to, uh, if I was interested in considering running for a local water district. And so I thought about it. My wife wasn't too happy with the idea, but so I really enjoy participating in the activities. I uh, I now volunteer at Desconso Gardens. Not actually, what I do is ride shotgun on a train that runs through there. But I mean, I I have a lot of interest time talking to the horticulturists who work in there and how they use the water and so forth. So. I just can't get out of the, the water interest, not that I do anything maybe productive. Maybe I do if I say something to those guys who work in, at the garden. Yeah, we should explain for the purposes of the tape that the Sconso Garden uh, is a botanical garden located in the La Cunata Flint Ridge area, open to the public. Uh, I'm curious, since you volunteer there, have you ever looked into their water supply? Do you know where they get their water? Oh yes, comes from the springs up in the mountains. I know all about the water supply. Why don't you talk about that for just one sure. minute? Because I think people don't, they don't get it. Yeah, because peop people say, I say, well, if you look up there on a the mountain, that's where the spring is, springs are, and they belong to the dis to Disconso. The water supply belongs to Disconso. And it comes down in a pipe, and I say, well, where do you get all the water? I said, because it comes out and it, Disconso has water rights to those springs. I said, without that, you wouldn't see all this water running through Disconso. And they probably have rights to more water than they actually use, do they uh, not? I, that I do not know, but I wouldn't be surprised because they recirculate everything. I mean, you know, water goes on those little streams through that whole thing and it gets pumped back up and started again. It doesn't get dumped out in the street. It's, it's used as long as they can use it. Right. And do you know where that water right came from? How did, I mean, not anybody could just go up and stick a pipe. No, I don't know how, all I know is that they hold their water right high up on the San Gabriels. I don't know how they got it. 
Um, you told me earlier that you're also doing a little bit of consulting for uh, once in a while for in the water field. Yes. Other cities. What kinds of work does that involve? Okay. I basically just work for a couple of water districts, Tatchapi Cummings, and they're probably who I do the most work recently is for them and uh, one is was trying to get them to use gray water or water that uh, ha they have a lot of high mineral contents uh, I forgot what it is now that's in there anyway uh, it's they use for egg for is it nitrates? Turf, yeah, nitrates. They're high nitrates. I'm running out of, <laughs> out of memories going. <laughs> anyway, they uh, up there, and what's happening is <clears throat> they have all of the water in the Tatchby Cummings Valley drains down to the Proctor Dry Lake. And so they're trying to get rid of, what are they going to do with the water in that's out there, and they said, well, they have a treatment, a uh, steam plants, and they're discharging water. And I, keep, I kept telling those folks, you know, you ought to, they were gonna want to inject it. And I said, no, why don't you evaporate it and use that water, it's high, high in nitrates. I said, the turf grass loves that, and I said, there's golf courses, there are parks, there's all kinds of things. Why can't you take that water and apply it for beneficial use for recreational areas? Well, it, there's the, I was amazed when I started going up there how much turf grass has grown. And I, you'll see 20 to 30 flatbed trucks a day go out of there with turf grass to Las Vegas and what have you. And that high nitrate water, the, the turf growers just love that because they can't get rid of it. They don't, they're building as you move up on the fan to the top to High Line Road. It's all housing tracks. G KB Homes are going in. You're talking about in Tehachapi? In Tehachapi Valley. And all of that, uh, they're all on septic systems. And so now they're having problems with that high nitrate moving down. And so there's arguments about where they need treatment plants and what have you. But uh, that high nitrate water now is uh, being used by the turf growers because they love to pump that out and uh, put that on the turf grass because it just eats up that the turf grass just loves that high nitrate high nitrate water. Well, it's, it's like pre-fertilized. It's pre-fertilized, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very good, and so. Uh, are you uh, also doing some work for Beverly Hills? Yes, I'm on a Beverly Hills Advisory Committee along with uh, Mel Blevins and uh, Glenn Brown. We're retained by them to look at things, and they're looking at trying to get them to, to develop more wet groundwater wells to utilize that groundwater supply instead of letting it move out and to maximize their local water supply that they have. And uh, so I'm involved with them. And then, uh, see, what's the other, I got on another committee. That's Beverly Hills. Oh, Santa Monica Mountain Trust. Mel Blevins is a great one for calling me in to say, well, he'll do this. That's, that's, that's how I get on these things through Blevins. And uh, yeah, we have looked at, at, at their end, and what, uh, that becomes the big water rights out there with, uh, they want to pump it, they, the environmentalists want to pump it and grow big green belts. And so they're drying up some of the creeks, or they were in danger of doing that. 
So there's been all kinds of environmental issues. I try to stay away from those, to be honest with you, but. Uh, well, let's, go, uh, let's go back to the board for just one minute. You, you say uh, issues, which you're dealing with, with these three entities, issues. Is there one major issue that comes to your mind while you were with the board that uh, took a while to resolve? I don't know that, uh, trying to think if there are any. I think when we got water down into the Coachella Valley and, and some of those areas, I think that settled a lot of dissatisfaction about the way water was used. And I, I sort of felt good about, I had a hand in working with those folks. Um, there's quite a bit of agriculture in the Coachella Valley. And yes, there is. People don't understand that, or don't realize that. No, it's... Well off the freeway. Yeah. Uh, is, that a, is that a good use of water? I mean, is that, a, is, is, it a, is that an appropriate use of water? Is it a good farming area? Is it, uh, it, the climate is good. They can get crops almost year round. And uh, I think you need a food supply you know, f uh, produce that is grown. Okay. And uh, there, there, if it wasn't down there, pretty soon it would be another Palm Springs, I think, and all that water. And I don't know whether, you know, you could argue, I suppose, that that's an economic use of water. And uh, My guess is that the farmers down there probably use water pretty efficiently. Oh, yes, they do. They allow a lot of drip and a lot of, you know, sprinkler irrigation where needed. They don't do a lot of flood irrigation. Um, is that because of the price of water, or is that because water is just a precious commodity, or...? Uh, I, I don't, I, I just don't know. I don't know enough of the farmers or talk to enough of them to, you know, to deal with it, but they seem to be very efficient in their application of water. And obviously, if they're pumping it up out of the ground, which I'm sure what they're doing a lot of, uh, it's, it's all a matter of economics. If you can get maximum irrigation uh, by something other, you know, something other than uh, sprinkling, if you can get it down on the ground, then you don't waste all that water in that hot, dry air. Okay. Uh, and speaking of growing things, one of the major events that was going on while you were with the board was uh, involved in the Supreme Court case, Arizona and California, and it had to do with irrigable land, land. Uh, along the Colorado River that was owned by Indian tribes. Were you involved in any of those discussions? No. No, I was not involved in it. So I was, outside. I was aware. Yeah, I was outside of my purview. Okay. Uh, over the course of your tenure at the board, you worked with a number of different personalities on the board. Right. Uh, Virgil Jones, Jones. comes to mind. Right. Uh, Lloyd Allen, Allen. comes to mind. Uh, a number of others. Yeah. Do any of the board members that you worked with uh, jump out at you as being uh, sort of interesting folks or? Uh, you know, neither good nor bad, just kind of interesting and interested in water. Yeah, I don't know. They were very friendly. I mean, I said they, I thought all of them had an interest in what was going on. It's look, for me, looking toward them was they were all interested. They were businessmen. They were interested in doing whatever they needed to do in order to maximize their income, which I would anticipate they would do. And therefore, I think they took, if there was a way to use less water, have to pump less water, whatever they had to do, uh, I think was what they were interested in doing. Okay. I was very impressed with the people who lived and worked down there and provide our food supply. 
Oh, you're talking about down in Imp Coachella? Coachella Imperial, Imperial yeah. Um, uh, Ernie, one of the events that occurred while you were at the board was an attempt at the state level to do away with the board as uh, either redundant or, or not useful. And then since you retired, uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger also had an initiative where he tried to get rid of a large number of boards and commissions, including the Colorado River Board. Uh, having worked at the board for as many years as you did, uh, can you talk a little bit about the value of the board? What, what does it bring to the table? Should it continue? Well, for one thing, I think it serves as a mechanism for communication between all of the parties who are in the Imperial Coachella Valley area, in the Colorado distribution area. And it gives an opportunity for interplay. I don't know what it's like today, but when I was there, there was a good camaraderie between the various water districts, and I think they were all concerned about water. I mean, they were concerned about their pocketbook as well, but I thought they were all very interested. And I don't know what it's like today, but I would think that uh, they were interested in preserving agriculture and develop reasonable development in the area without turning it into another, you know, giant what do I want to call it, a housing tract or something. Do you envision, having spent as much time as you did in the Coachella Valley, uh, do you envision uh, that area of California becoming overpopulated with, with homes and strip malls and things like that? Or, or is the geology and the weather and the water supply, does all that mitigate against I mean, it gets hot out there. Yeah, to me, <laughs> to me personally, that kind of weather I would not enjoy. I like the warm weather, but I wouldn't want to live where I had to be in an air-conditioned house 24 hours a day because it was 120 outside. And uh, we go down to Palm Springs occasionally. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Uh, follies that they have in Las Vegas and oh, uh, sure. yeah well, we go down to that every year and we have a good time and we stay overnight and do some sightseeing and I look at all those wind machines and everything else and I think is this area really going to develop and what I guess the developers can build more houses more condos whatever they want but I would think there's, and maybe there are enough people that like that kind of climate. I, and I think it'll probably continue to grow, but uh, the city of Palm Springs, like I say, we go down there for the Follies presentation and we go down there occasionally and for a day or sometimes we stay overnight for a couple of days and come back. But it's not a place I'd want to that I would choose to live. Okay. Are you originally from Southern California? Yeah, I was born and raised in L.A. I'm sorry? Born I was born and raised in L.A. In Los Angeles? Yeah. Did you, what year were you born? 29. 1929. Mm -hmm. Well, there was another big event that year, wasn't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you anticipate Los Angeles and the and the greater Los Angeles area growing the way it has? No. No, I was, well, you know where Fremont High School is. That's where I went to high school. <coughs> and uh, there was no transport. Well, you rode to school on a yellow streetcar. I mean, that's the way you got back and forth to school. And uh, everybody rode bikes or something. You didn't have, people didn't have, many people have cars. A few people had cars. So I think I had an old clunker I bought somewhere down the line. But uh, I think that just the whole living in Southern, at least that part of Southern California, I don't know what it was like if you lived in Beverly Hills or, you know, West LA, but uh, it was a, 
a middle, low to middle income family. I mean, income families. Mm -hmm. Very few people in our neighborhood own cars. I, <laughs> but a, a trip, I mean, you live in a, town, in a city called La Crescenta today, which is about 15 miles north of downtown Los Angeles. But when you were growing up, I mean, La Crescenta, number one, it didn't even exist. Didn't exist. Uh, and number two, that would have been like a weekend trip up to the mountains. Oh, yeah. A lot of people who, old timers who live there, tell us about how they used to come up and pitch a tent and they'd go hiking up in the mountains. And those are now houses. They're not, that's all housing tracks. I probably live in what I miss now, for all I know. Okay. Well, anything else that we didn't ask you that uh, comes to your mind? No, I don't know if I've given you much information. Well, uh, it's, it's information we didn't have before, so uh, you know it's a, it's a matter for those future historians yeah. watching the tape. And I I sort of hate to think that you know eventually we're just going to see one condo after another, and just in a little local locker center area where we live, uh, there's a lot of griping about the fact that everybody's mansionizing, and they're. In a little local throwaway paper every day, there's articles and articles written by the people, not articles, but letters griping about, you know, I used to be able to see this mountain, so I used to be able to see the valley. I can't see anything more now. There's just houses going up every place around me, and all I'm doing, I might as well live in downtown L.A. And uh, you see that continuing? Yeah. I, I hate to say it, but I think unless somehow there's some sort of control and land use or something to say, you know, you can't uh, do these things. Because every day where we live is, <clears throat> I don't know, they're 40 years old, 35 years old. But every day there's articles of paper about somebody's building another house. They're mansionizing the area. That's the big pitch up where we're. Everything's mansionizing. And uh, used to have a view of the valley. I used to be able to see down in the valley. I used to be able to do this. Nothing now. All I just see is another house that I'm staring at next to me. There are some people who think that by limiting the amount of water available, that you could stop that growth. Do you do you buy into that or? Are people going to show up and it's up to the water district to meet the... Uh, I think the pressure would come on, being on a water district, I think the pressure would be there that you have to provide water. You know, that's, that's your mandate is to provide good and water supply to meet the demand. And then you hear the other people who say, I built this house, lived here for 20 years, and now they're building a two-story mansion and all I can see is in their back window. And now they've taken away. So what they're demanding of the city of Glendale is to put in new ordinance that says you can't build a big house that's going to block other people's view. So it takes away. So I see that a lot. That seems to be a lot of turmoil just in the local area around us. But, but as a member of a local water board, uh, what we, I'm hearing is that we don't would not be in favor of using water to limit growth. No, I don't think we have a right to. Our our charge is to provide the de water demand is needed, and I don't think that it's the business of the water district to say, "Well, we think there's enough development in here, so we're not going to provide." This is all the water we're going to provide, and as long as we have pumping rights, and as long as we have ability to buy water from Metropolitan or whoever the supplier is, buy it through Foothill. Uh, I don't see why we should be, we as a water district, should be someone who regulates growth. That's the city's job, not ours. Okay, very good. Well, Ernie, thank you very much. We appreciate the time. Oh, you're welcome. I, I enjoy doing it. Like I say, I don't know, uh, you know, well, more it was interesting some of the early days and uh, well we'll leave that to others to decide yeah somebody else can decide what they want to do I uh, probably I don't know in another year or two our uh, son and daughter 
daughter-in-law and our only grandkids are talking about moving to Portland. They got fed up with the traffic and everything else down here and her parents live in, in Portland. So they're talking about going up there in the next year or so. Well, that's our only family. <laughs> so guess where we're going? So you're going to be looking for a, a house, house in Portland? Portland or someplace in that part of the country. And I keep telling Judy, do you realize it rains every day? <laughs> I said, so every day I show her the times and the weather report for Portland. <laughs> it's raining. Well, there are some things more important than other things. Oh, yeah, right. And it, it's it's nice up there. We've we've been up a couple of times to uh, to look around to see what we would do or where we want to go. So it's all where your family is and what you're going to do. That's where it's going to drive you, regardless of what happens. You know? I mean, if the kids were staying down here, we would be here. We wouldn't be any place else but here. <laughs>